Episode of Life Below Zero. The future is uncertain as winter sets in. You know, Alaska's always going to have the upper paw. Nature wins. Sue tackles the threat of an unwelcome visitor head on. Only a fool forces a situation where we all have guns. It's tough sledding for Andy on the Yukon River. Something rot right here. What the hell's going on? Glenn chases the hunters of the Arctic. Wolves went right through here. And the hailstones brave the ice for native trade. Don't you can't get too close to me. You're going to freak me out. What the Uh, my wood pile over by my workshop is getting kind of low now i probably got enough for maybe two maybe three days so you never have enough wood when you're heating with wood we'll take all the older fat dogs out today give them some exercise take a relatively small team out and make them do some work with these winds like this is probably going to be a lot of glare ice out on the ford lake it's a little bit dicey when you got a sled full of heavy wood like that on that that uh, glare ice in winter the frozen lakes and rivers that surround Andy and Kate's camp serve as highways to various resources. But traveling on ice is not without its dangers. What kills you out on that glare ice is you start sliding sideways, it instantly wants to flip the whole sled over. You get thrown off the sled, you smack your head, it's just all around a bad day. Let's go harness some dogs up and go get some wood. Yeah, you're like a big old blimp, all. Let's go haul some wood and work some of this fat off. Going and getting loads of wood, the biggest challenge is on the way back. This little sled is small, but it's going to have close to 500 pounds of birch wood in it. And once it starts sliding one way or another, that's a lot of force. Turn, <laughs> freeze up, exercising dogs and getting firewood is a big part of my life. <laughs> disaster you have to go slow if you can you got to kind of take the momentum out of uh, turns be a little bit cautious but you know when the dogs are ready to go and and they've got a lot of power there's not much you can do except for just hold on oh, I had a girl ah the girl let's go straight ahead up, 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 up. this is kind of the area I like cutting wood the uh, flood in 2009 wiped out this whole forest and just stacked it up right here so there's a lot of really nice good dry birch and cottonwood and spruce just a big mix of everything it's uh, only about two miles from my house so it's not terribly far to go get it i want to get the sled a little bit closer to where the wood is because i don't want to have to carry it any farther than i have to so we'll get a little bit of wood cut up here and start hauling it back i educated myself that nobody else can make you happy that's something you do yourself. They can add to your happiness, they can take away from your happiness, but never without your permission. I did not know if I could run Kavik on my own, so backup plan, uh, friends of mine had this cabin in uh, Fairbanks, so I bought the property, but my pilot buddy, flew over and said, hey, you know that cabin you got? I thought I saw smoke coming out the chimney. You might have squatters. And if somebody is squatting on my property, what you do, you get there, only a fool forces a situation where we all have guns. Definitely for me, I'm packing the 454 pea shooter. The process is I get there, go in and defuse the situation, see what the situation is, handle it. After leaving Kavik for a foot procedure, Sue Akins will travel 150 miles to investigate possible squatters on her property in central Alaska. The freezing temperatures have created treacherous road conditions, and driving is a risk. I have a window of opportunity to check on this place. I haven't driven this road in three, four years, and uh, it was really bad conditions. It's not a great road. For me, this is Fairbanks. This is where we are now. But then we start going up and, uh, you know, we're going to go higher up in elevation. We got several summits. We're going over the White Mountains. This right here, this is not guaranteed to be open. That's what all that means. 
This is winter, and I've got a big old pass to go over and 150 miles to get there. The world moves so fast here. In Kavik, I'm going putt, 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 five miles an hour thinking I'm all that. And uh, here, people are going 50. And uh, I don't have any control. They're passing me. Nobody passes me in Kavik. I don't know. Are they drunk? Are they sober? Are they able to drive well? It's a whole field of unknowns. So for me to, to be close to the the social world everybody else lives in, you know, it's a, it's a lesson in how's it feel to have no control. I look at the subsistence way of life, and I see a lot of uh, good in it. I see a lot of health in it. I see a lot of my family in it, and I see a lot of prestige. I mean, we don't have a lot of money here in this house, but people give us respect. For the hailstones, the freezing of the Kobuk River is a brief window for the family to catch whitefish as they migrate, a key source of food and trade for dark winter. Well, you know, it's the time of year when whitefish run, and the whitefish run when the ice is starting to come along in the fall time. When they're here, there's lots, and when they're gone, there's nothing. After setting the nets before the freeze, Chip and Agnes return to the river to test the newly formed ice to make sure it's thick enough to support their weight. along here checking out the ice I can see that it's frozen a lot of thickness to it there's no um, bottom ice water top ice it's all just ice 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 all the way to the river so this is really good chainsaw is a new technology and my took is my old technology either way I get through the ice going by we get lots and then when they're gone they're gone and pretty soon there won't be any white fish at all under here they'll have all passed by it's just the way that everything is around here um the white fish are passing by and the time to get them is now and we're on it i don't think life has a meaning it's not the kind of thing that has to stand for something else a letter has a meaning a word has a meaning it stands for something else it represents something else but life just is it just exists caribou i walk out here on the lake just a little ways in front of camp where i have a good view of all the mountains around the valley i spent a lot of time out here with binoculars just looking for caribou caribou are one of the most important animals to me out here glenn villeneuve relies on the limited animals that surround him in the brooks range for survival as the days grow colder it is crucial for glenn not to let any opportunity for me pass him by this time of year they often come down this way and they'll pass through this valley some years. Other years, they stay up high on the mountains. When I can intercept them, I like to. I'm just looking around to see if there are any in the area. Right now, I'm living on moose. I've got a moose that I killed about a month ago, but I don't have any other meat here. I see caribou, they're up on the ridge. They're a long way off, they're out of my range, but there are a few of them up there. I don't have a trail up there right now, so. 
it'd be hard for me to get up there right now. I probably wouldn't be able to intercept them. By the time I got up to the top of that mountain, I think those caribou are going to be gone. They're traveling. If I had caribou here on the lake, that would be really nice, but they're not down here. So I'm going to make do with the moose meat I've got. Hear that? It's wolves howling. I'm going over there to see what's going on. Hear that? It's wolves howling. I'm going over there to see what's going on. I'm headed over here because there's some wolves howling. Ravens flying up out of this willow field. It's about a half a mile from my camp. Something's going on. I think the wolves killed something over here. I'm gonna go over there and see if I can find it. Sometimes if I get there fast enough, I can get some meat off of what they killed. And they may have killed a caribou over there as possible. I'd love to get some caribou meat. Uh, getting across the creek up here is gonna be a little problem. Pretty slippery, all covered in snow. I don't want to get my feet wet. Made it. The wolves are right up this way. Right through the brush there, the snow's all knocked off. The wolves went right through here. Just a little while ago, they knocked all the snow off the brush right here. These are the tracks. Dude, here it is. Caribou. They killed right here. The wolves killed this caribou. Oh man. There's not much left. I got here too late. They cleaned up most of it already. They made a mess of it, as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing on there for me to eat. Still meat here that the wolves will eat, but I wouldn't eat any of this now, because it's all been chewed up by wolves. They're just scraps left. What I love about living out here the way I live is that most of the time out here is just very calm and meditative. It's a very silent, quiet environment. It's very peaceful out here. But that calm and peace is punctuated by excitement like I had today when something like these wolves come along, kill a caribou. It's the, it's the contrast. I like to live a really quiet, calm life out in nature most of the time, but I like the excitement that happens every now and then. Something like happened today. A pack of wolves in my backyard killed a caribou. Keeps life interesting. There's nothing there for me though. I'm gonna head back, go back to camp, Make myself some moose hoof gelatin. Remote people aren't ones that really like to stand still and let the world fall down around us. If it's falling, you know, we're there to be like Atlas and hold it back up. After getting a tip that squatters are on her property in central Alaska, she was traveling 150 miles in icy, perilous conditions. No matter where you are, whether you choose to live in town or out of town, you know, Alaska's always going to have the upper paw. Nature's got the upper paw. Nature wins. You can lay down a piece of pavement and nature's going to say, hey, what? watch what I do to you now. You know, how'd you like that? taking a, a minute and giving the pause a little bit of a break they're sore doing the uh, manual transmission but you know as you look out across this vista here this is the 12 mile summit wayside but it's the uh, Pinnell Mountain Recreational Trail I always kind of stop here um, at this area almost 40 45 years ago the state dump truck lost control swerved killed a bunch of my friends and hurt some others and family members so for being somebody who doesn't drive often kind of curious you know 40 45 years later i'm on the same stretch of road and it's a little icy and i got little hurt paws and you know 
take a minute to uh, my heart to theirs. You know, don't ever forget your family, friends, and the, deci the decisions you make today could have deep ramifications. That sun's getting real low, so I better start making traps. control of the vehicle you know i got it back yeah the speed limit's 55 F you people have a very romantic view of nature kind of peaceful and beautiful it's actually there's a lot of suffering that goes on in nature piece of butchered meat that I have. This isn't even enough for a day. I have to go out and get some more meat down off the meat pole now. Thaw it out in here and cut it up into small pieces so I can cook it and eat it. With his stock of meat wearing thin and unable to harvest caribou, Glenn must rely on his stored meat cache to harvest a healthy supply of protein. At this time of year, I've got my meat in two places out here. Some of it's hanging off this pole 20 feet high and some of it's up on this platform 15 feet high. The purpose of these structures is to keep the meat safe. If I didn't have the meat up there, wolves would come along, bears would come along, eat the meat up. So I have to keep it up high out of reach. Right here, I've got a moose head. I killed this moose in the fall. I buried it in these antlers in order to protect it, try to keep ravens off of it. And now the snow's fallen on it and protected it further from the birds. I just have to dig it out and throw it down so that I can bring it inside, thaw it out, and butcher it. Here's my moose head. Nothing got to it. It's in good shape. Birds didn't chew it up. No animals got to it up here. This looks like a tasty hoof. Take that one. Living out here in the Brooks Range, I'm highly dependent on moose and caribou. They make up the bulk of my diet. And it's important to have variety in your diet. You can have a lot of variety, even when you're only eating one or two species of animal, as long as you make use of all the different parts. This is all thought out. I'm gonna start with this hoof this morning. All the ligaments and tendons in that hoof will boil up and they'll turn the liquid that I boil them into gelatin. I'm gonna skin it. And skinning a hoof is tricky. I enjoy skinning. It's an interesting process, especially when you get into the details, just to understand how things are put together, how animals are adapted to the function. It's interesting. A hoof is a part of a moose that's often not utilized today, but I like to use the hooves. The gelatin that's used in processed food today is made from hooves of cattle, mostly. And I make mine from the hooves of moose. So a lot of people are used to eating gelatin. They just don't know it. Gelatin comes from boiling up ligaments and tendons, a lot of which are found right here in the hoof. When I started living out here, I wanted to live as much off the land as I could. And I started experimenting and realized that just living on steaks and roasts and muscle meat every day is not good. But if you eat all the different parts of the animal, it feels good. Gelatin in the making. One thing I'll say about this country out here, there's no guarantees to anything. The way it is is the way it is. If you can't handle that, you don't come out here and do anything. This 
is my favorite place to come get wood because there's lots of it from the 2009 flood. Lots of variety in a small area. That makes hauling wood become a much easier job. Well, this little sled, when it's full of birch, is probably about 400 pounds. And then another, with me and all my winter gear, is about another 170, 180. So you're looking at 600 pounds in a sled. So that's about a little over 100 pounds per dog to pull. Alaskans are very unique people. We're all very independent, especially people living out in the bush. We live out here to live a certain lifestyle, to be connected to the land, to get the resources from the land, and that's what's important to me. The big thing is when you've got a heavy load, you got more momentum when you start sliding out, you got more torque when everything starts twisting. It's hard on them. And anytime you put weight in something, it totally changes the whole formula. I'd say that's a load. In winter, Andy's dog sled is essential to gathering resources, but adding weight to his sled could make for a difficult trek on the ice. The big thing I have to worry about is when I'm sliding sideways, hitting the snow drifts. Cause that'll flip you in a heartbeat. Okay, let's go. We'll see what it's like out on that glare ice out on the lake. It's pretty, pretty windy out. It's just in 25 to 30. And this is like a giant sail out on that lake ice. so the stanchion's wanting to come up. This thing comes apart. I could be left standing with just a driving bow, a piece of wood in my hand, and the dogs go home, and then I got a long walk home. It could bust on me, and I could fall off and smack my head on this ice. You just don't want to take chances. And the worst thing that can happen to dogs is running free with no driver on the back. That's when dogs get tangled up, legs get broken. These guys are my buddies, and they're depending on me. I'm making the right decision right now. Take the weight out of this sled, I'm gonna be okay. I like everything's about efficiency. Push economics. Some happens. Ah, here's another place that broke. That sucks. Here's this plastics cracking here. This broke under here too. Basically, I'm gonna have to rebuild this whole sled. All right, that's the case, and better get it home and get on it. There is no food that evolved in order to feed something else. They're trying to survive, and then something comes along and eats them up. This gelatin's been boiling for a long time, and all the ligaments and tendons off that hoof have boiled down now, and that's gonna gelatinize that liquid. But I have to separate the bone and the tissues from the liquid because I like my gelatin nice and smooth. When this cools, I'll have about a gallon of gelatin. That'll be really tasty, moose gelatin, it's good stuff. I'll set this outside to cool. Right behind this eye, there's a big chunk of fat. That's what I'm going for, right 
here. So I go right down in here. That's the eye fat. That's really tasty. Fat is very important in the cold weather. And when I'm not eating a lot of carbohydrate, most of my calories come from fat. Look at that. All that fat right from behind the eyes of that moose. Here we got some gelatin. Oh, that looks delicious. The idea that it's a bad thing to kill animals, to hunt, to eat animals because it causes suffering, that's all tied into a modern view of life as being something that is comfortable and gentle and peaceful. And that's one way of looking at life. But I, I like the reality of life under more natural conditions, which isn't always pretty, but it's real. We're not trying to catch the tail end of anything here. We always have fish, we always have caribou, we always have heat. Kids are clean, well dressed, pretty happy with ourselves. We're gonna get is we're gonna get food for ourselves and for our dogs. Because the dogs gotta eat and we like to eat. And the way it looks, over the next couple, three days, we should have a lot of trade. Whitefish is a good commodity around here. You can get a buck or two for each fish in trade anyway, worthwise. It works out really well. This one looks almost like it was caught in the net before. I'd say that uh, if we get lots and lots and lots and lots, we won't only have for ourselves in trade, but we'll be able to give plenty away too. And my wife has sisters and uh, that are elders, and we have other people that are elders that rely on us for the fish. The hailstones have a limited window to harvest whitefish, an important commodity for meat and trade. But working with heavy nets on the ice cannot be taken for granted. The water is getting deep on the river top here. Ice might not be strong enough to hold our net, fish, and snow machine, and people. I'm afraid of the ice getting thin or rotten. There's a lot of times when it just doesn't look safe enough. <laughs> Dude, you can't go too close to me, you're gonna freak out. What the Dude, you can't go too close to me, you're gonna freak out. What the There's no need for you to freak out. Don't be setting yourself up for being like that. Get it out of your mind. Sing a song. Whistle. We've got water flowing on top of the ice, but under the snow. So this isn't exactly the safest way to be out here doing this stuff, but um, we're not doing too bad. We're doing pretty good. And we're not falling through. We're, we're pretty well pretty well off here. If it gets any more dangerous, we may skip a day or two. Hopefully it'll get colder. Other than that, just keeping up with the net is the way to go. Looks like we have enough. I probably will just pick out a few good ones and keep them aside for trade, eh? We basically do call this shopping. I got almost 80 fish. I can't think of the last time we've even bought fish. I mean, where would you even buy fish in a store except maybe a can of tuna? I don't think I've ever bought a fish. I've sold fish. I've traded fish. Ah, this one's full of eggs. The bottom of the... Super eggs. Oh, this one is a good one. You want them? I have other methods of getting them to my mouth, but yeah. You got a bunch more over here we could trade off if you don't eat them all. I, I'm not going to eat them all. I'm going to save this one. White fish with eggs are the real prize. Real good trading material if you come up with a whole bunch of them. Um, people will trade you gas or food or things from the store. How about when we get these home, you'll, you can get on VHF and see if anybody want to trade. I can think of a lot of things I'd like to have. Their own, they can. Yep. I'll grab that in. Thank you. If you have a few of these basic tools so that you can turn natural resources into the things that you need to build or create your life the way you envision it here, then those are tremendous assets for me. I'm gonna get this beast over in the shop and try, try and rip her apart. I think I could have been in big trouble if I would have left that load in. It's it's barely held together, but it got me home. And that's all that mattered. 
this is a lot quicker for me to rebuild this than to start from scratch and build a whole sled. Put some new plastic on it, she'll be like new, and hopefully I can get another five or six years out of her. I like this sled. I've done a lot of miles with it, and I've hauled a lot of wood with it, and it's one of my favorite little sleds to run around. It's kind of my little Corvette, so I want to keep using it. That was the guilty culprit. That's definitely needed replacing. It's all messed up here. It's broken all back in here. That's all it would have taken for me to lose that sled. Probably the hardest part of the whole process is cutting a big piece of this plastic by yourself. It's um, it's like trying to cut a giant noodle. I didn't want to screw that up because that's about a $350 piece of plastic. <laughs> I'm always nervous when I'm making my cuts on that because one mistake and it's a lot of money down the tube. It is the most important part it's the foundation it's like the foundation of a house you know if you have a lousy foundation you don't have much of a house it's nothing like running a new sled psychologically it's you know you're just put a bunch of work and time and effort into something it's always always a big deal one more screw i love making a mess i always hate cleaning them up all right i got her done it's time to take her out and See how she tracks and go get some wood and run some dogs. Bye. As remote people, people in the bush, you know, we kind of have a saying that, uh, you know, we're all out here because we ain't all there. are just really bright really active so that's pretty cool northern lights are considered a pretty lucky sign so cross my fingers hopefully it's lucky for me we're trying to find the lead-in trail to the cabin but in the dark when all you can see is a few feet they all look the same but there's the hill and I'm at the top of the hill so it's got to be around here somewhere Sue is traveling to her backup cabin in central Alaska to investigate a tip that there are squatters inside. But without any daylight, she must approach with extreme caution. And my property starts here, on the right-hand side. Okay, and there's a vehicle in my driveway. But it doesn't look like it's moved for a while. And that's my driveway, right there. And there's a vehicle there. This has been here a while, man. Somebody's using it as like a trash dump. They just parked it here to try and claim something. I mean, I've never had a huge log across my freaking driveway. They say a lock only keeps out an honest man. But they say a lock only keeps out an honest man. Somebody's been here. Didn't respect that it wasn't theirs. This has been junk here for a bit. 
Looks like maybe with the mattresses on the floor and all that, it was a party house. From being a cute little kitchen area to being this, the only thing that I can see to fix that is a sledgehammer and some gasoline. So, I mean, all I'm going to do is assess the damage and make a decision. Do I, do I want to stay here and start working on it now or make a plan for the future? It's a little creepy seeing the baby stuff, but uh, to have little babies out here and in this kind of a mess, this did not come overnight. This is not somebody who went hunting and thought, yeah, hey, nice hunting cabin. You know, we'll use it for a weekend with the boys. This is a family invasion, man. Really, the only thing, uh, after seeing that, the only thing I can do, I can't stay in the cabin. I've got a blanket, I've got a car, and I got time. But you kip out for a little while, get up in the morning, and, and see where you're at. Right now, where I'm at, it's not a healthy place mentally, but a lot healthier than staying in there. I'll make a decision when I see it in the daylight how I'm going to handle it. smell it more in the day that ain't pleasant i've just got to assess make a plan see what i want to do who puts a freaking chicken coop in a house where do you pick and choose what you save and what here that I don't feel creeped out about. I came to get intel on squatters. I got more than I bargained for. Life's like poker, you know, you got to play the hand you get, you know, make the best out of it. It was a lot of effort to get out here. It was monetary and personal, not a wasted trip at all. Emotional trip, you know, head trip. And the structural integrity is still here. You know, cosmetic integrity, no. I got to get back to town. I got to get my stuff together. I got to get Ermi. I got to get back to Kavik. And I have to make a plan to make this better. Dealing with multiple personalities, 10 or 12 dogs or even five or six dogs, you're going to deal with issues at times. And it's how you work through those and come home at the end of the day that makes it fun and exciting and challenging. of his dog sled, Andy must retrieve the firewood he left behind and make sure his sled is fully able to withstand the harsh winter trail conditions. see me or hear me move one of these sleds around 
it's chaos in the in the yard because they're happy and they want to be the one chosen to go. Here we go G up here, Toby. adjusted just perfect. So, uh, I'll float the wood and split a little bit up for tomorrow morning. You can see my wood pile is about gone, so this is good timing. If all goes good, I won't have to do this repair for a long time again, but just another day in the life of a dog in my dog lot. Right, boys? They love it. Yeah, boys. <laughs> self-perpetuating that's the best part about it so it's like basically being self-employed in a bit of a business that can perpetuate itself but it's giving the money part mostly went inside to get on a VHF and I got a feeling she's going to probably get rid of most of these here today. Um, not too many people are running nets right now. I have some whitefish outside if anybody's interested in trading for gas or grub from the store. I'd be interested in some fresh vegetables to trade for. Thank you. Oh, hello neighbor. Hi. I just heard it over the VHF that you're willing to do a trade. Sheepish, whitefish. Awesome. I have the ones with eggs over there and one salmon. Oh, awesome. Here's awesome. a bag of fruit. Look one. They're, they're so right. really about the same. Right on. Thank you, neighbor. Hey, neighbor. Not bad. Three fish. Five gallons of gas. I was asking for gas. You can take, um, I guess, whatever you want. Put these two in the oven. Fry that one for some other time and give this to your puppy dog. Yes, potatoes. Hey, a few people came over. Now I have some apples and oranges, some fresh fruit. I have um, five gallons of gas. And now I also have some potatoes and onions to go with the fish dinner I plan to have tonight. Awesome. Bye. Whitefish is a very valuable commodity up here. It's almost like um, a dollar bill to us. It's a delicacy people love and they'll trade almost anything for some of the fish here. And for us, this is like a, you know, economic bonus. We uh, get fish, we can trade them around. We got gas so we can go check our nets with our machine some more. My wife got to trade for some fruits and veggies and other stuff, some, some oil. It's kind of the way we have to work with things. I get to hang out with my kids, get to work with my wife. This, this is for sandwiches for tomorrow. If you guys don't finish it. So we've got fish for ourselves and fish for our family, our extended family. Fish to give away to friends and for gifts and stuff and fish for trade, like Nordic dollars. So they're white fish. Yeah, everyone likes them. Not a bad day, eh? Nope, it's pretty good. Good team. I got five gallons of gas outside, and it didn't cost me nothing but a couple fish. Gee, where's this great? <laughs> <laughs>